What is a biomechanical system and how do we describe its motion? Watch this video to find out. Hey guys, Dr. Gooden here with a video about biomechanical systems and its motion. Now this is the second video in my series on applied biomechanics and it will take us through an entire semester's worth of biomechanics information. Um, in this video we'll be talking about systems and motion but specifically about anatomical and directional terms that we need to know in, in order to describe motion um, as well as Cartesian coordinate planes. All right, let's get right into it. So what is a system? A system is any structure or organization of related structures whose state of motion is of analytical interest to the biomechanist. So this structure could be something like a limb or a segment or maybe even a joint. And the organization of related structures um, could refer to a human body, right? The entire human. Now, a biomechanist might be interested, let's say, in studying a type of injury. Let's think about the NFL. Right now, the NFL is sinking millions of dollars into research surrounding concussions, as well as millions of dollars into the um, research and development of better helmets in order, in order to prevent these concussions. So let's ask a series of questions to help us specify this system of, ana of analytical interest. So what is the sport? That would be American football. We already answered that. What injury? Well, concussions. The injured body part would be the brain. What is the age of the system? It might seem at first like this doesn't matter, but a lot of research is pointing to uh, changes in the brain as these players age. Um, in this case, it would just be the age of the group studied. But we might control for age or we might uh, use age as a factor and divide players into different age brackets or something as we're studying this. What is the sex of the system? Well, it's predominantly male in American football, but we could also study concussions in other sports where more females play as well. Now, th this is not at all an exhaustive list of questions to ask about the system. It's just, just a few examples to get you started. But as you drill down deeper and ask more and more questions, your system of interest becomes more well-defined. Now, in order to better understand our system, we need to know about some anatomical terminology. And the first thing to know is anatomical position. It's the most common reference position, and it's defined um, as a person standing erect with all joints extended, feet parallel, palms facing forward, fingers together. And I have a picture of it right here. So here's somebody standing in anatomical position right here at the top. Anatomical. position. All right, now from anatomical position, we want to be able to describe directions. So let's say you have your system of interest that, you know, a person or a subject in your research and they're standing in anatomical position. How do you speak about their head in relation to their um, shoulders? Or how do you talk about their right knee in relation to their left ankle? How do you talk about their hand in relation to their elbow? Well, we use a series of directional terms um, and they're listed here on the screen. Superior means closer to the head, so higher up. Inferior, closer to the feet. If we want to say something is anterior, that means it's towards the front of the body. Your uh, manubrium, let's say, is anterior to your thoracic vertebrae. Posterior is to the rear of the, of the body. Your glutes are on the posterior aspect. Medial is toward the midline. So your belly button is medial, or hopefully it's medial. And lateral means moving, movement away from the midline away from the midlines. So let's draw that out on our person. Okay, I drew the arrows. Um, try to label these in your head before I get to them to see if you know them. All right, so what's gonna be going towards the top of the body? Well, that's going to be superior. And then away from the head towards the feet is going to be inferior. Towards the front of the body, we are moving anteriorly. And towards the back, it will be posteriorly. 
Now heading towards the midline of the body will be medial, and away from that midline will be lateral. All right, so those are the directional terms of the human body. Now we have more terms, proximal and distal. Um, these, are, these typically refer to positions on a limb. Proximal means closer to the attachment of the limb to the body. So my shoulder is proximal to my elbow, which is proximal to my wrist. And distal means further away from that attachment to the body. So my wrist is distal to my elbow, which is distal to my shoulder. And then superficial and deep. Superficial, um, we, we tend to use this word when somebody's shallow, you know, so not very deep. Superficial just means close to the surface. And deep means farther from the surface. So let's draw those out. All right, I have my arrows drawn, see if you can guess before I write. So away from the uh, place of attachment will be distal. And towards it will be proximal. Okay, so now that we have some directions, superior, inferior, proximal, distal, etc., we need to talk about planes of motion. Now, a plane of motion is a plane through which movement occurs, and it's, how, it's one way that we use to describe motion. Um, a cardinal plane is a plane that passes directly through the midline of the body. If it's not passing through the midline, then it's not a cardinal plane. Um, and it divides the mass of the body in half. So we have three cardinal planes. Sagittal divides it into right and left halves. A frontal plane divides the body into anterior and posterior halves, and transverse divides it into superior and inferior mass halves. So we're going to go ahead and label those on our person. So these rectangles that you see are the planes. Zoom in. There's the frontal plane dividing this person into a front and a back half, or an anterior and a posterior half. And here is the sagittal plane. And the sagittal plane will divide somebody into a right and a left half. And then finally, we have the transverse plane. Transverse. And this would divide somebody into a top or a superior and an inferior half. Okay, so those are your three cardinal planes of motion. Now, Every time motion occurs in one of these cardinal planes, it occurs around an axis of rotation. And the axis of rotation um, that goes with that movement is always paired with a certain plane of motion. Okay, so an axis of rotation is a line that is perpendicular to one of the described planes. The medial lateral axis, by its name, I'll let you guess which direction it runs, medial lateral, medial and lateral, uh, it passes horizontally side to side and perpendicular to the sagittal plane. Okay, let's label the medial lateral axis. Okay, so horizontally side to side and perpendicular to the sagittal plane. Medial lateral. Medial lateral axis. Now the next one, anterior posterior, and again the name should give you a clue which directions it runs. It runs horizontally front to back and perpendicular to the frontal plane. Okay, so let's see horizontally front to back perpendicular to the frontal plane. Here's the frontal plane. Perpendicular to that would be this axis right here. And finally, the superior-inferior axis. This passes up and down perpendicular to the transverse plane. All right, so it's the last one left. It's gonna be hard for me to label. I'm gonna label it at the bottom of this person. Okay, and there you have it, the planes and their associated axes of movement. Now, when you do something like elbow flexion from anatomical position, your forearm is moving through a sagittal plane of motion, okay, a sagittal plane, but the axis of rotation is at your elbow, and that axis of rotation is going to be along the medial lateral axis because it's running horizontally side to side, all right? Likewise, if you're gonna do something like a lumbar rotation of your spine, okay? I'm rotating through a transverse axis that divides my body into top and bottom halves, um, but that axis of rotation, sorry, transverse plane, but that axis of rotation is going to be the supero-inferior axis, 
running up and down. It's also called the vertical axis. Okay, so now we have some directional terminology. We have planes of motion and we have axes of rotation. So now we have to talk about the center of mass or the center of gravity. These are two different things. The center of mass is the point at the intersection of the three cardinal planes. So it's intersection of the three cardinal planes and it represents the average location of a system's mass. If you could somehow balance somebody or any object right at its center of mass, it would be perfectly balanced. Gravitational pull is concentrated at the center of mass, so it is synonymous with the term center of gravity. We can use these somewhat interchangeably, although it's important to remember that mass and weight are two different things. Okay, so let's draw the center of mass on our figure. And it looks like it's going to be unfortunately located in kind of a funny position, <laughs> right there, in the center of that intersection of all three of these planes. And I'm just going to abbreviate C-O-M for center of mass. Okay, so we've described these planes, these axes, and these directions, but how do we tell how this system of interest is moving in space or even in relation to itself. Well, we have to come up with a way to track its location. And we do that using a Cartesian coordinate system. So a Cartesian coordinate system is a frame of reference defined by an origin and either two or three orthogonal axes. Um, each of these passing through the origin and defining one spatial dimension. That sounds really confusing, but when you see a drawing of it, it will be become more clear. So we have both 2D and 3D coordinate systems. A 2D, two-dimensional coordinate system, has two axes, the x and the y axis. A 3D coordinate system has an x, y, and a z axis. Okay, so those are two distinctions there, but then we also have what are called global or fixed um, coordinate systems, and then we have local or somatic coordinate systems. So a global coordinate system stays where it is regardless of where the system of interest moves in the room, uh, whereas the local or somatic coordinate system will move actually with that uh, system of interest. And it can either be in a fixed direction with the system of interest, or it can actually um, be fixed to, say, a segment or a limb of that system. Okay, so we, use, we often use multiple frames of reference with, uh, to address a single problem. Where is the system moving in relation to, to space in that, fixed, um, axis, in that fixed coordinate system? And how are the individual limbs or segments or joints of that system moving in relation to its own body. So let's take a look at some coordinates. Okay, here we have a, on the left side, a two-dimensional coordinate system. And here we have, on the right, a three-dimensional coordinate system. Okay, and you see, the, on the 2D one, you see the y-axis at the top, the x-axis um, going horizontally, and the center point right here is labeled zero. And so as you travel this direction on the x-axis, that's going to be positive, and this direction on the y-axis will be positive as well. As you travel this direction on the x-axis, it will be negative, and this direction on the y-axis will be negative. All right, so depending on what quadrant um, something's in, so over here, it will be positive x and positive y, negative x, negative y, positive x, negative y, and negative x, positive y. So we have four different quadrants in this 2D coordinate system. Now it's a little bit more complex in the 3D system. Again, we have an x axis over here. We've just kind of rotated it a little bit. And we have a z axis and a y axis. All right, and you might sometimes see these 3D coordinate systems labeled where Z is the top axis, but in this case, for biomechanics, we're gonna use um, the, that vertical axis labeled as Y. Okay, and so the same rules apply. Um, there are directions to these axes. So this would be positive, negative, positive, negative, positive, and negative. So within a Cartesian coordinate frame of reference, we would define our system of interest using what's called a free body diagram. A free body diagram is just a simplified representation of the system free of movement of the environment. It's often going to be something like a stick figure or a geometrical model if we're talking about, let's say we're talking about a ball that's kicked or a javelin that's thrown or some other implement, it might be a geometric model. 
and it will have the center of mass defined and points of contact with the environment will typically be shown. Sometimes when you're visually assessing movement, it's too complex and there's too many moving parts to, in order to uh, fully and correctly analyze the movements that are occurring. So by simplifying it, we get rid of all the noise and we distill it down to just the simple movement that we want to analyze. And this often makes it possible to then upload your model to um, some sort of uh, biomechanic software motion capture that, that then allows us to perform deeper analytics on that movement. So let's take a look at what a free body diagram might look like. Okay, so here I have just two simple representations of um, athletes in motion, but they're paused in motion because a free body diagram is free from the motion uh, when we draw it. And then we, once we have it defined, then we can actually allow it to move around. So what I'm going to do first is I will mark the joints of interest in these, um, in these systems. So in this first system, we have a neck, and we have two shoulders, a little bit of rotation going on in the trunk, which is why the left shoulder, which is further back, is, uh, is more posterior, and the right shoulder is moved more anterior. We might have two hips. Hopefully we have two hips. Here and here. We've got two knees, two ankles, and let's also mark the forefoot. We've got two elbow joints, two wrist joints. Okay, just to keep it simple. And now what I will do is draw out the segments connecting these joints. Okay, so what you want to do is, these lines should be straight. Mine aren't very good. It's hard for me to draw with this pencil. Oops. All right, so there's free body diagram number one. And let's mark it up on this person squatting. And now the reason I'm doing both of these is to show you two different angles, from an one from an anterior aspect and one from a lateral aspect. So you can see these free body diagrams. All right, so there we have our two free body diagrams with the joints labeled as well as the segments drawn in. Now, when we're talking about movements and skills, we can put them into two different categories. Um, closed skills, which are actions performed under standardized environmental conditions. So in this case, the nature of the task is going to be more or less identical each time. So you want to think of something like a free throw in basketball. Every single time you step up to the free throw line, it's a certain distance from the hoop. The hoop is a standardized height. The ball is a standardized weight and pressure. And um, there's no, nobody defending you. And you just get to make that free throw. Now, it's a little bit different every time. So really, this, this whole standardization, um, it's, it's more on a spectrum, right? Because you could be at a home game where everybody's silent while you shoot so that you can concentrate and you know you have your team at your back, maybe you're in the lead and so there's not very much pressure and, and you can really focus on the shot. Or maybe it's an away game and it's a championship game and you're coming from behind and the crowd is crazy and there are people booing you. Well, that's going to be a different set of environmental conditions even though it's the same free throw shot. So really, it's, um, we wanna think of this as a spectrum. Now, in open skill, these are actions performed in a dynamic environment. So the uh, conditions are unpredictable and open to change. So this might be um, a soccer pass while defended by two defenders. Okay, so you need to try to clear the ball up to the midfielder, but you have a defender coming at you from the front and from the left, and on the right of you is the sideline. That's going to be a different type of pass than if you are in the midfield um, and you're clearing it up and you have nobody defending you. Okay, these will be two different skills. Um, well, it's the same skill but two different types of conditions, hence it's an open skill. Okay, that wraps up part one about biomechanical systems and motion. If you liked the video, if it was helpful to you, give it a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel for more content about biomechanics, strength and conditioning, anatomy, um, and sports science as well. If you have ideas for future videos, I'd love to hear about it down in the comments, so let me know and I'll try to make it happen. All right, thanks.